I'm Pastor Schuler. Uh, I've been here for the last two months at Memorial Drive United Methodist Church. I'm currently in seminary uh, with the hopes to be a pastor somewhere in the Texas Annual Conference in the upcoming year. Um, and so for the last six weeks, we've been looking at our Summer Smoothie Sermon Series. If anybody in here can say that seven times fast, come find me and I'll give you $10. Um, <laughs> but we've heard Pastor Michael and Pastor Jenny so far preach about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity. And today, uh, we'll be talking about faithfulness. So before we begin, I'd like to read uh, two scriptures, one from Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 25, and one from Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Second reading from Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Let us pray. Gracious God, let the words of my mouth, the thoughts of my mind, and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, so that you may become more and I may become less. Amen. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Saturday afternoon in July of 2010. I was at my house, sitting on the couch, watching a Braves game with my parents, as we often do on Saturday afternoons. And I remember just kind of blurting out, out of the blue, as a rising high school senior, that I wanted to go to an out-of-state college. I lived in the small town of Chapin, South Carolina throughout my entire life, and while I loved South Carolina and still do love South Carolina, I wanted the next chapter of my life to be somewhat different. I wanted to find a way to get out of my comfort zone and explore a territory that no one in my family had ever been before. I wanted to be a trailblazer. And like many high school seniors who might be in the audience today can relate, I wanted to go somewhere that was more than a couple minutes or hours down the road so that my parents could not come surprise visit me, which they definitely would have if I did. So I applied to colleges far and wide, colleges in the north, south, east, and west, and like everyone that applies to college, there were a couple schools that I classified as my dream schools that either had high admission standards or did not get, give a lot of money to students like me. And during this time, I remember feeling a lot of excitement, a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. But I also remember feeling mass urges of anxiousness, anxiety, nausea. So whenever I would talk to a close family member or friend and talk to them about the college application process, there's a variety of different ways that they would respond. You know, there were always those people who would keep it super basic and just tell me, you're going to be fine. No matter what happens, you're going to be fine. And then there were those who took this as an opportunity to really try to build me up and encourage me, telling me that, you know, this was what they thought was on the path for me and, and, and try to really build me up in that moment. And then there were people that you know, shot straight with me and told me they thought I was crazy and they weren't so sure it was going to work out. And, you know, I think we all need people like that in our lives sometimes. But there was one word that continually kept being used by people when we would talk about this decision. It continually came up after conversation, after conversation, after conversation. People would tell me, have faith. Keep faith. Don't lose the faith. Faith is a word that we often hear talked about in church, we're going through times of doubt, uncertainty, and the unknown. We hear about keeping faith while we're going through difficulties in our workplaces, in our homes, and in our families. We've heard about the importance of faith when we've become unemployed. We've heard about the importance of faith whenever we've separated from a spouse after many years of marriage. We've heard about the importance of faith whenever we've experienced the loss of a loved one who's been battling health issues for a long, long time. We hear about faith in all of these strenuous life circumstances, 
But what does being faithful truly mean? And if we're faithful, what can actually happen as a result? And this brings us to our text that we find in Hebrews this morning. Our scripture reading from Hebrews 12 said earlier, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so close, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, a cloud of witnesses, This is another phrase that I feel like is thrown around a lot in church, and we just don't understand what it's mean. We don't know what the author is actually talking about. I'll be the first to admit that when I heard this phrase, I remember it. I was in middle school, and I thought that the cloud of witnesses were the Sunday school teachers who were going to tell my parents that I had been misbehaving. We really don't know who the cloud of witnesses is when it just gets thrown around without any context. So who is the author talking about in the cloud of witnesses? I had a professor tell me in college one time that if I ever became upon a text that used the word therefore and didn't actually talk about what happened in the therefore, he would find a way to revoke my undergrad degree and my future seminary degree. And since we are now live streaming and I have no idea who is watching, y'all are going to have to bear with me because we are going to go back to Hebrews 11 and talk about it. Hebrews 11 begins with the author saying that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. I find it interesting here that the author first defines faith, but then talks about the Christian ancestors who showed what faith actually looked like in real life. And for the rest of this chapter, the author talks about these prominent Christian figures who by their faith found favor with God. And there's a lot of people that are listed in this chapter, but I'm going to try to keep it brief today and just talk about three. Noah, Abraham, and Moses. These three Christian fathers all exerted a great deal of faith, but they did so in a multitude of different ways. So the author first recounts the faith of Noah. We learn about Noah early in the book of Genesis. God tells Noah of God's plan to destroy the wickedness that lived among humanity. God reveals to Noah that he's going to bring, God's going to bring in a flood to cleanse the earth of this wickedness. God tells Noah to build an ark with extremely specific instructions for how this ark should be built. All the engineers and architects in this room will be very happy to know that even God finds specific, useful practical ways to talk about the length, height, and width of the upcoming ark. God then tells Noah what should be included in the ark, accounting all birds, animals, and, quote, every creeping thing of the ground. God also lets Noah on the minor detail that after all of the flooding is over, God is going to establish a new covenant with Noah. This all happens in less than one chapter of Genesis. And at this point, Noah has to be on information overload. He's found out all these things about the world being destroyed, about building an ark that will escape the flood, and how there's a new covenant coming within here. And I feel like I speak for all of us when our response to God in this moment would have sounded a little something like this. God, are you kidding me? How am I going to do this? Why do I have to do this? What? This doesn't make any sense. But that's not how Noah responds. We're told in Genesis 6, 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. That's it. We don't get an indication that Noah asked for clarity. We don't get an indication that Noah asked God for a rain check. (laughs) Get it? Because of the flood? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) But friends, Noah trusted God. Noah didn't need an explanation for why this was necessary. Noah didn't need visual proof for why God's plan was the best plan. Noah placed his faithfulness in the God that he knew to be omniscient and omnipresent. Noah isn't the only one who responds to the outlandish charges of God. Let's go fast forward to Abraham now, who, during the time of the text we're about to go through, is well over 100 years old. And God tells him, Noah or Abraham, I want you to look up at the stars 
and count them, if you can. Thus your descendants shall be. God told a man who was over 100 years old, who was childless at the time, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Folks, that's simply outrageous. But Abraham doesn't see it as outrageous. In fact, we're told that Abraham believed the Lord. Believed the Lord. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Noah and Abraham's stories of faith show us that faithfulness in God requires us to believe and trust in bizarre things. In both these stories, it's easy to see all of the fruits of faithfulness that both Noah and Abraham placed in God. Sure, there were struggles in their lives, but their faithfulness to God yielded them a great deal of success. But if we're being honest with ourselves when we read this, it's confusing because there have been times in our life where we have been faithful to God through thick and thin, day after day, month after month, year after year, without ever physically seeing the fruit of our labor. When we read through the stories of Noah and Abraham, it's easy to feel comforted when we see a God who fulfills the faithfulness of God's people. But it's equally confusing when we take that and we don't see that in our lives, in our daily walks with God. So that's why I think it's so important that the author of Hebrews also used Moses as an example of faithfulness. Throughout the book of Exodus, Moses does many things after his encounter with God at the burning bush. Moses takes a stand against the Pharaoh. He says, let my people go so that they may worship God. Through his faith, Moses is able to part the Red Sea to create a passageway for the Israelites to escape the clutches of Pharaoh and his men. Moses is there for when God gives the Ten Commandments. And in many ways, Moses is the model depiction of what faithfulness looks like. When Moses first encounters God, God charges him with the task of bringing God's people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And throughout the books of Exodus and Numbers, we follow Moses on this journey. We're told of all the difficulties that arise with the people that were not the Israelites and within the Israelites too. But we're told of his enduring faithfulness to God. The text consistently shows us that Moses is dedicated to furthering God's kingdom on earth. There's no debating that. It's easy also to assume that when we get to the end of the story, it's going to be a storybook ending with Moses getting into the promised land, the lights shooting up, his eyes filled with happiness and joy, the end, roll credits. But when we get to numbers and we really read about what happens, we're thrown somewhat of a curveball. In Numbers 20, verse 8, God tells Moses to take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. This seems crazy at the time, but this probably seemed routine for Moses, with God issuing a command and Moses doing exactly what God says. We're then told that Moses, instead of commanding the rock, lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. This is a minor mix-up, it seems like. I mean, Moses is okay to make a couple of mistakes down the road. He still got the same results and got water for his people. It's not a big deal. I mean, this is Moses we're talking about, the one who freed the people from the Pharaoh, the one who parted the Red Sea, the one who found the Ten Commandments, the one who's leading God's people to the promised land. But the Lord says to Moses, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land, the promised land that I have given them. After all of this time, after all of this effort, after all of this dedication, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Jesus ring true here for Moses. Moses has been faithful to God throughout his entire life. He's trusted God. He's been assured of the things hoped for, and he's been convicted of the things unseen. And because of a mere formality, Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land. 
when we reflect on this, it's easy to ask ourselves what the purpose of faithfulness truly is. It's easy to wonder why we should live lives of faithfulness to God when it doesn't necessarily assure us of comfort and satisfaction. This is particularly true in the American society we live in where capitalism runs rampant. We have to be number one in everything, the best. We have to climb the corporate ladders to superiority. It's easy to believe that by being faithful, we should receive more blessings from God. And this is where I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding of what the fruit of faithfulness grants us. I think we often equate faithfulness with bringing in prosperity. We believe that faithfulness to God will bring us financial stability, relational success, and friends, that's a misinterpretation of what faithfulness truly is. If you don't remember anything that I've said today, if you have already zoned out, please check back in and please remember this. Faithfulness plus time does not always equal earthly prosperity. I'm going to say that again for emphasis. Faithfulness plus time does not always equal earthly prosperity. Sure, there are many times in our lives where we have been faithful over a long period of time or even a short period of time, and we have seen the fruits of those labor. But if our faithfulness to God is solely grounded in our desires for worldly success, folks, we have a shallow faith. As Christians, we're not called to place our faith in God solely so that we can receive preferential treatment on earth. We're not living our lives to be put on earth's VIP list. We're called to place our faith in God because God is love. God has loved God's people throughout all of the ages. The Lord our God is the God who maintains loyalty with those who love God and keep God's commandments. Folks, when we're assured of this knowledge and we truly think about its implications for our daily lives, it lets us become free from the worries of positive results here on earth. Faithfulness is not shown by the stacks in our wallets. It's not shown in what we wear. It's not shown in the square footage of our house. Faithfulness is shown by how we respond to the charges that God is placing on our spirits. Faithfulness is being in a constant state of discernment and adherence with God. We shouldn't be faithful because faithfulness gives us an upper hand in life. We should be faithful because we worship a God who took a formless void of darkness and created life. We worship a God who sent Jesus Christ, the greatest gift of all, so that the world was no longer condemned, but saved through him. We worship a God who sent Jesus Christ, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We worship a God who sent Jesus Christ, who endured the pain of the cross because of the joy he knew that was coming as a result. Faithfulness isn't rational. It's not always logical. It's definitely not the easy way out. But faithfulness as displayed by the cloud of witnesses paints a portrait of us for what real relationship and fellowship is. With God should look like. Noah, build an ark, place a pair of every living creature on it, and prepare for the flood and for a new covenant that I'm beginning with you. And he did it. Abraham, if you're age of 100 years old, you will have descendants that are as numerous as the stars. And he believed it. Moses, you will lead a political revolution. You will escape the clutches of the Pharaoh by parting the Red Sea. You will receive the Ten Commandments. You will lead God's people to the Promised Land, but you will not be able to enter it for yourself. And in the face of disappointment and confusion, he pressed on. Each one of these witnesses discerned and adhered to a message of God by being faithful. They didn't ask what their reward would be. They didn't tell God that they were waiting for a better offer. They discerned on what God was calling them to do, and then they adhered to those charges. So my question for you all this morning is this. What is God calling for you to discern and adhere to? Maybe it's reconnecting with a friend that you've lost touch with who you know needs support right now. 
Maybe it's being more attentive to the wants and the needs of a family member. Maybe it's sitting down with a coworker who seems like they want to know more about the Christian God or they just need love from somebody, somebody to hear them. Maybe it's visiting Vacation Bible School this week to love, nurture, and educate the future of the church, folks, the future of the church. I challenge you to recklessly place your faith in the God of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control for no other reason than the knowledge of God's love for you. God is never finished with your life. Even in periods of difficulty and strife, God is present and God is always calling us to discern it here to God's charges. So this week, I ask you to listen. I ask you to pray. I ask you to think. I ask you to talk. I ask you to reflect. And I ask you to be faithful. Amen.